walk in like, oh, one affordable house, please, you know, and my friend here, and we could not find him any place to live. He's got $770 a month fixed income from his disability. We finally found a place, an apartment, that would rent to um, people like him without any credit history and any references, and, and it was $490 a month. And I said, Ken, here's the deal. I'm going to sign this lease. First of every month, you're going to come to my office. You're going to count off 490. The second you're a day late, that becomes my apartment. My name's on it. You're just subleasing from me. Oh, for sure, Paul. Oh, incredible. Yes, yes. Got him in this place. For the next six months, first of every month, he'd come over, count it out. And at the end of six months, then the the landlord now rented straight to Kent. I could get off the lease because he had proven himself as a good tenant all this. During that six months, I found out Kent was an addict, extreme opioid addict. Kent was obviously homeless. Uh, Kent had a ton of health problems. Kent had behavioral health problems. Kent had been estranged from his family. His family wanted nothing to do with him. He had no one in his life. I was the only person he had. So I gave him a job at my company. He'd empty garbage twice a, twice a week in the mornings. Just shuffle around the office, kind of disturb all my employees. He just wanted someone to talk to. And found out Kent was a poet. He liked to write poetry. He's a homeless poet, he called himself. So I did a Kickstarter campaign to try and publish his book of poetry, which was his lifelong dream. Got the campaign funded. We got his book of poetry published, and the plan was Kent was going to take those books of poetry, and they're twenty dollars. And he would walk up and down Phillips Avenue, and he would hustle his book. Hey, I'm Kent Benson. This is me. Book of poetry, twenty dollars. And we set up a bank account with him, with his name wasn't on it, only my name. Building up this nest egg, helping this guy try to get back on his feet. Well, Kent did a few things to piss me off, and a lot of things. And I said, Ken, I need a break from you, man. For the next five days, you can't call me, text me, anything. I just need a break. At the end of those five days, I got a call from the Sioux Falls Police Department. And they said, um, Mr. Tenhagen, do you know Kent Benson? And I said, yes, I know Kent Benson. And they said, well, we found him dead in his apartment. And I said, okay. And he had been dead for about five days. Uh, and the neighbors uh, smelled Kent's body. That's how he was, it was known that there was someone in there. And the cops knew to call me because they won the apartment. And there was these stacks of books. And I did the forward in the book. So they looked, opened it, and they knew my name, and they called me. And so now, I have this guy, I'm his only person. I gotta track down his family. Do you wanna have a funeral? Like, dude, you know, he had three kids living in Denver. And the point of this whole story is that there are Kent Bensons all over Sioux Falls. There's Kent Bensons in Vermilion, there's Kent Benson in our country. And he personifies what a lot of our challenges are. He's an addict has housing problems, he's got no one investing in him, he's got no one giving him any time, he needed a job. And I used the, the small things I could to try and help this guy. But what I need, and when I speak to people in Sioux Falls, I say, I need everyone to find Kent Benson's to help. Okay? The world would be a great place if everybody invested in a Kent Benson in a big, substantial way. And I'd be lying you know, my part of my call to public service was not to care for people and invest in people who need it. You know, invest in people in our, in our country, uh, and specifically our city, who need a hand up, right? And so um, that is a motivator for me to serve every day. I think sometimes people assume when you're in public service that you're simply serving the development community, wealthy people, there's crookedness, there's bribes, there's all this crap that goes along to associate with being a politician. Um, 
And the truth is, most people in politics, they're in it because they want to serve people. And they really do want to help people. It's hard to do that sometimes, but there's a lot of Kents that need help. So that, that is a picture. I want you to remember that guy's face when you think about um, the role that you can play, not only currently in your current situation, but when you get out of here, you're going to land in a city somewhere, and you're going to have an opportunity to help and to serve. Whether it's in politics, whether it's in nonprofits, whether it's serving in a church or something. And that one effort, when we have people who work together, is really what makes our country great. It's what makes Sioux Falls great. Uh, and so that's the story of how some marketing walk got into public service as the mayor of Sioux Falls. So thank you for staying awake. I don't see anybody nodding off. That's good. I would love to, uh, in the last few minutes, take any questions you guys may have on me, on work, on Kent, whatever. Yeah? Uh, how did Kent die? Kent uh, had COPD, uh, and he coughed and coughed and coughed, and he couldn't get over this coughing spell, and he, he bled out in a chair. And I had to clean out that apartment. Can you imagine what that was like? Because I was still on the lease to my apartment. So, but think about that. If you don't, if you don't call your parents for the next couple of days, if you don't respond, there'll be an army of people out searching for you. I mean, this guy was gone for five days. The only person who missed him was was no one. And the only reason it was discovered that something's happened is because someone's done something. It's really a sad ending. And since, uh, since I've been mayor, I've learned about what we do with these John Doe's that die in the city. We don't have anyone. And we have, the county has line items for the cremation of people who just they have no one and they just vanish like that. It's, it's heavy stuff. Yeah. Light it up. Give me a fun yes. question. Sorry. Yeah. Question yeah, way in the back. I don't know if this is going to be a limit, but I'm from Sioux Falls, and I, I saw that your the main issues that you're trying to tackle, um, two of them were narcotics and crime. Um, what is your strategy and approach to try and solve those issues with the growth of Sioux Falls? Yeah. So regarding narcotics, we just Sioux Falls just released their crime numbers, and our, our crime rate um, in Sioux Falls grows like this, and our population rate grows like this. So our crime is really very low in Sioux Falls. What has grown like this, however, is narcotics. Last year we seized 1,600% more heroin and fentanyl than the year before. We seized almost 600% more meth than the year before. So. There's a two-pronged approach that we're taking. One is much more enforcement. Okay, I have I've added some narcotics crimes unit people uh, added to our drug task force. We're currently looking at adding a cyber forensic specialist. A lot of these transactions for narcotics happen on the deep web, the dark web, and um, so we need to try and counteract that activity. But then we're also working on something called the triage center. And I'll tell you why this is important. Right now, let's say we're in Sioux Falls and there's a dude passed out drunk outside this door right here. Or someone being real belligerent, yelling as high as a kite. What we would do right now is we'd take him to jail, we'd take him to detox, or we'd maybe take him to a Vera Sanford's ER. But we're going to be building a triage center. What a triage center will do is it will take that person to intake and will diagnose what's the problem. Does this person have a mental health problem? Does this person have a physical health problem? Do they have an addiction problem? Or are they just a bad dude that they need a jail cell? Versus trying to incarcerate all these problems, which isn't always the answer. A lot of times it, it is, but there's times it isn't. So we're also investing in this triage center. Because sometimes people will say, Paul, you just seem really focused on enforcement, and cops, and more cops, and narcotics crimes unit. That's part of the problem, and we're going to do that but we're focused on these treatment avenues as well. So of all the issues facing Sioux Falls, that's probably the one that I, I get most worried about is how do we corral that. Yeah? Um, 
what construction project are you most excited about? I'm most excited uh, about a remodel we're doing at my house right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably not what you mean. <laughs> but in downtown Sioux Falls, we have a huge parcel of land where the BNSF rail, rail lines used to be. And we are reissuing an RFP for that land development you know, probably within the next within the next month at the longest, maybe the next two weeks. We had a proposal done, I was excited about it, kind of fell apart due to some changing project construction costs. But downtown Sioux Falls, it is where it's at. It's awesome. And that is just a, some of the discussions we're having with people on what's going to go there is just incredible. The other thing I'm really excited about that you guys have to you, you guys have to take advantage of is this summer we're opening something called the Levitt Shell. It's good. It's it's on the north end of Phillips Avenue, Fourth and Phillips. It is a huge outdoor amphitheater, and there's gonna be 50 free concerts there throughout the year. It's awesome. It's a partnership through a grant with the Levitt Foundation. The construction's almost done. It's great. And on top of it, college kids, it's free, okay? Won't cost you anything. Come downtown. That one I'm really excited about too, which is nearly done. I got time for probably one more question. I'll go right here. Yeah. What's your plan for bringing uh, 5G to Sioux Falls? Like, what is it going to take to get it here, and how long do you think it's going to take before we actually see it? So his question was, what will it take to get 5G in Sioux Falls? So I want to clarify one thing. 5G does not exist yet. It's a technology that's being worked on. So what these cities are doing, like Sioux Falls, is we are approving ordinances to allow us to put in the infrastructure so that when it's ready, we can flip the switch and turn it on. So if I can just nerd out on that question real quick, this is how this is how five this is why 5G is so transformational. Normally you have a cell tower like this that puts out signal. You may have a tall building, and you may be standing here trying to use your phone. Well, you may get crap signal because of this building. How 5G works is there are small cell, they go on light poles, they're this big, they're, they're not big cell towers, every 500 to 1,000 feet. And so you can triangulate these, these signals to get strong signals. So what we have entered into is an agreement with Verizon to start installing these small cells in around Sioux Falls with the, the hope of having an active 5G network in 2020, sometime in 2020 would be the hope. Uh, and then I'm meeting with AT&T and some of their leadership um, in April to talk about <coughs> AT&T's small cell deployment in Sioux Falls. So it's still a little ways off because Verizon and the carriers are still developing the technology that's going to run on those small cells. So I know that's real nerdy, but that's kind of where that is, is headed. So, unfortunately, I have to go. I have daycare to pick up. My wife's gone. So, um, I'm a mayor dad. My daughter's six. So, um, thank you for having me. Thank you for your attentiveness. Uh, I want to actually give Ashley, I want to give you the copy of this book. So, yeah, I got one book for introducing me. Thanks, you did such a good job. It's a book of his poetry. Um, it's just, it's, it's really powerful. And so, Thank, yeah, thank you. you for choosing me. Thank you guys for having me.